Well, good morning or afternoon, wherever you are around the world. I am Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and it is an honor to be back again with you. This is shaping up to be, I think, what's going to be one of my favorite talks. Uh, we're going to start continuation with the sacraments and especially confession. Now, eight months ago, I did a talk that you may have viewed online called Confession and Divine Mercy. I've now changed that to say Confession Part One. And today, we're going to talk about Confession Part Two because there's so much in there. And what I'm going to bring you, there's just a tiny bit of duplicate, but I think it'll be a good refresher. And then the rest of it will be new stuff about this important sacrament. And then we're going to finish explaining about Father Seraphim, our beloved patriarch who we just lost, who just passed away, and how that role of him um, it gets us to see the importance of confession and divine mercy. And so that'll be at the end here. So please stay with us um, as we're very happy you're here. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to bless our time together, to open our minds and hearts, to receive the grace you wish to bestow. Father Seraphim, we ask you to intercede for us. We believe that your work in divine mercy, as Jesus promised, he would defend all those who spread mercy at the moment of their judgment has resulted in you being in heaven. And at this time, if so, we ask, please guide us and help us and intercede for us. And we ask this through the intercession of our Mother Mary and through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wow. Okay, so as usual, I ran over here, got set up with literally 30 seconds before, so... I'm still huffing and puffing a little bit, but God bless you. Again, I got about two hours of sleep last night, so please, if I miss something, sometimes I accidentally, my mind is thinking one thing, but I accidentally say the opposite. Um, God bless you. Hopefully, you'll, you'll uh, bear with me <laughs> on that. All right. Wow, what a day today. We have confession <clears throat> and then leading into divine mercy and Father Seraphim. So, Confession is one of the sacraments the church calls the sacrament of healing. So I want to first start by looking at why did Christ institute, now you saw from the title slide, even though I'm going to talk about both healing sacraments for a minute, it's confession we're focusing on. But penance or confession and anointing of the sick are the sacraments of healing. Now, why did Jesus institute these? All right. Jesus heals the body in anointing of the sick, but he heals the soul in confession. Now, we are a body-soul composite. We need both. Now, our bodies need, as you've heard me say before, a daily bath. And why would we not think that our souls don't need a bath? The church tells us we got to go at least once a year. If we only take a shower once a year, don't get near me <laughs> because we're going to be smelling and our soul will be too. But the church says at least once a year. Hopefully we go more than that. Let's look at our first slide here. Here's a beautiful picture of our Lord, right? So Christ is the physician of our body and soul. He instituted these sacraments because the new life that he gives us in the sacraments like baptism, can be weakened and even lost because of sin. So even though we're baptized, that doesn't mean automatically that we're perfect. You guys know this. And so he gives us the sacraments to help us get back on track. Therefore, Christ willed that his church would be the administer of that. Somebody has to be the administrator of that. And Christ gave it to the church to continue his work. It's his work. The church just continues it of healing and salvation by the means of these two sacraments. Now, let's then go on and talk about confession. All right. 
the name of this sacrament could be the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of forgiveness, the sacrament of confession, the sacrament of conversion. They all apply. Now, somebody would ask, Father, you Catholics, if what you believe is bap in baptism is true, that it forgives all sins, why is there a sacrament of confession after baptism? Well, this seems pretty clear. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But the new life of grace that's received at baptism, the new creation, did not take away the weakness of our human nature, which is now broken, nor the inclination to sin called concupiscence. We now are born with a tendency to be selfish, greedy, lustful, uh, prideful, um, impatient, uh, slothful, um, all the seven deadly sins and the temptations of the Ten Commandments. So Christ instituted confession, all right, for the conversion of those already baptized. We have to be baptized before we can even receive confession. But the reason is, is those who after baptism have separated themselves from Christ are now able to get this. Because remember, conversion is daily. I said this last week. Conversion is daily, so it's inevitable that we will mess up. We will mess up. Thus, God gave us this sacrament of confession. Now, what if, for instance, your marriage was over after the first argument? because your spouse never forgave you. You being forgiven by your spouse after probably many, many, many arguments over your marriage is the, something we're thankful for. What if our friends, even our family, never forgave us after one argument? That would seem impossible. So now we have the ability to turn to the sacrament for forgiveness whenever it's needed, any day. This is incredible. You know, the angels didn't even have this opportunity. The angels were given one shot. When God created the angels and man, he put them both to the test. The angels were put to the test. That was the fall of Lucifer and a third of the angels. And man was put to the test. And man fell. Now, the angels didn't get a second chance. This is the incredible gift God gives to humanity. Well, why, Father? Why is he so mean to the angels? No, the angels have a superior intellect than us, and so they could see the consequences of their actions. They could see a bigger effect, and they still, a third, made that choice. We as humans, we're blinded. We have to go by faith. We don't see totally the effect of our sin until now. When we turn to God and say, Lord, show me so that I can have a contrite heart. So God gave us mankind the ability to go back again and again and receive confession. But like the angels, that time will end in terms of our testing. And that's when we die. When we die, there's no more chances. So we have to do it now. That's why Father Seraphim was so ready and prepared. God rest his soul. Thank you for the life and times of Father Seraphim. And so this is important. Okay, so what we're looking at here is, is basically this. The angels made their choice. We fell, but we have an opportunity to redo it in that confessional. So... Somebody might say, well, why not just redo baptism? All right. Baptism is the only way to wipe out original sin. Confession doesn't wipe out original sin. Baptism does. Well, Father, I thought confession wiped out every sin. You have to be baptized first. That wipes out all original sin. And then any personal sins after are cleaned in the confessional. So this is why the only way to wipe out original sin is baptism, then it is gone forever. And a mark is left on your soul. That mark says, I belong as a child of God, and you are now then able to be saved, to be entering into the kingdom of God. So, four sacraments are not repeated. Three are. So the four that are not are confirmation, marriage, holy orders, and baptism. 
These are not repeated, but confession, communion, and the anointing of the sick are. Because those are regarding something that we can get messy up, messed up again. The food from the Eucharist is needed because our bodies need food. And confession is needed because our bodies need a bath. All the time, regularly, ongoing. And this is what we have. All right. So the daily call, and here's what's going on here. A mark is left on our souls. But as since I said, we can commit personal sins afterwards, even after baptism, which is different from the inherited sin of original sin, we need cleansing. So the daily call of Christ is to conversion from personal sin, and this continues even in the lives of the baptized. This is why Father Seraphim constantly gave, if he ever went to him for confession, his penance always was to pray for the conversion of sinners, even baptized, of course, and that's why, because St. Faustina in her diary said at the three o'clock hour, what we need to do, she didn't even say pray the chaplet. She said, first, Jesus told her to pray for the conversion of sinners. And then after that, to meditate on his passion. And that's why we pray the chaplet every day at three. It's a meditation on his passion. All right. <clears throat> so. She, and this is, this is interesting because the call to Christ is needed every, every day. And so the Holy Mother Church includes this in her prayer for sinners. But remember, we have sinners in our midst. Even though the church in her divine nature is holy, in her human nature she's broken. So there's sinners in our midst. We, we know this. That's another topic for another talk, this church scandal. But remember, don't leave Jesus because of Judas. And that's what we got to remember. All right. Now, let's get in. Here's what I'm going to do, just a tiny bit of duplicate from my talk eight months ago. So don't turn it off because you're like, okay, now, Father, I've heard all this already. No, just about five minutes or so I'm going to duplicate to refresh your memory. And then we're going to go on to new stuff. All right. Let's look at our next slide. Who is the minister of the sacrament? Well, wait a minute. There's the Holy Father receiving confession. Who's giving the confession? Another priest. Christ entrusted the ministry of reconciliation to his apostles. But it didn't end there. It would make no sense for Christ to only save those people who lived during the lives of the apostles. And once they died, and Jesus then went to heaven, and he no longer was on earth, that there was no way to be forgiven of sins. So <clears throat> his apostles handed down to the next bishops behind them, because they were the first bishops, their successors. The next bishops who were ordained by the apostles were their successors. And then those bishops ordained the next priests as their successors, as their collaborators. Now, all who are thereby instruments of God's mercy, and officially that's the clergy, priests, bishops, the Holy Father are basically the instruments of God's mercy and justice. Those who are the people who can administer it. Now, Father, I knew that, but we're going to get deeper here. Now, if those are the people, who can actually forgive every single sin? <clears throat> of course, God. But can you go to your local priest for any sin? Father, you told us in a previous talk, all sins are forgivable. Yes, except one, sin against the Holy Spirit, which is putting yourself outside the mercy of God. But by going into the confessional, by your own free will, you're not guilty of the only unforgivable sin. So you can be forgiven that confessional, but do you know that there are some sins you cannot? Now we get it interesting. Do you know that there are some sins that are reserved just for the bishop and some sins just reserved for the Holy See? They're called late sententiae. And these are important because all sins are forgivable but the absolution of certain grave sins 
is reserved to the Holy See or the local bishops or priests that were given the authority. What do I mean? These laite sententiae penalties are, for instance, breaking the seal of confession. If I'm a priest and I break the seal of confession, unfortunately, I just can't go to another priest and ask for absolution. This is how serious it is. I actually have to have the priest contact the Holy See to grant the permission to forgive me. Do you know you can break the seal of confession? You don't have to repeat just by listening in. I was at a church down in Connecticut, and they had these confessionals that were only covered by two screens and there was nothing really of any substance in between except me, the priest. And one person would come in the left and another person would come in the right. And then they would wait where I heard one confession give absolution. And then when I turned around, I noticed the other person was sitting there. I stopped the confessions immediately. And I called the deacon over. I said, deacon, can you please kneel down here and just recite the Our Father? And I went around to the other confessional. I could hear every single word. I was mortified. I was shocked. These people had been sitting there kneeling, listening inevitably to the confessions of the other people. Now, I'm not saying they did it intentionally, but they thought nothing about it. And I was shocked. I stopped that immediately. But if you hear intentionally the confession of somebody else, intentionally, you've broken the seal. You don't want to do that. So we need then to go to the priest and explain what happened and say, Father, this is a serious thing. It's the same with desecration of the Eucharist. Or as a priest, there's many restrictions. If a bishop ordains somebody not to be ordained, that is, requires the Holy Father. If I am a priest and a priest commits adultery with a woman and then gives that woman absolution telling her you know what you can commit adultery with me because I'll give you absolution right afterwards that priest cannot just go get confession he has to go get permission from the holy see that's how serious the church takes this and so we have to make sure all of this is taken into consideration very powerful all right so let's keep moving let's keep going on is a confessor then bound to the seal? Absolutely. Everyone is. If I break the seal for any reason, even if somebody tells me they're going to go commit a murder, my job is to best beg them and plead them and pray for them to, and I'm sorry, here's our next, uh, next slide. I'm sorry. The seal of confession. <clears throat> this is the next slide. This is the important topic here. Do you know if anybody even says they're going to commit murder to me? And this is where people have a tough time understanding the church. I cannot act on that. I have to beg and plead and pray for them to turn themselves in or not do it. Pray for God's grace and mercy. But I can't. If somebody commit, uh, confesses to me that they stole a bunch of money, I cannot turn them in. If somebody confesses to me that um, they cheated on their wife. And I know that and I see the wife. I can't even indicate, you know, watch your husband. I can't. That's a breaking of the seal. And so when a spouse goes into the confessional, let's use that as an example. Do you have to tell your spouse to be fully contrite that you committed adultery? If it's in the past and it has ended and you are no longer doing it, no. Because now it could end the marriage. But if you are continuing it, that's a different story. So <clears throat> as a priest, this seal is very, very important. And a priest will never break it. I will go to my death. You have to understand. Now, there might be some times where, you know, a priest might inadvertently say something unrelated, but never should it be the direct ever the confession uh, of somebody. Now, I can't even use that information, as I said, in making decisions. If I know somebody's dishonest with money, I can't say you can no longer work here based on what I knew from the confession. I have to treat it like I never knew it. 
And I know people are, have a hard time understanding, but it's very important. You, as I said, are also bound by the seal. And so very important. Now, let's keep going because we always ask, and I've, you've heard me say this before, this part is going to be the duplicate. I'm sorry. <laughs> and that is, is the priest the one who forgives the sins in the confessional? And everybody says no. And if you've heard my other talks, the answer is yes. Christ had the ultimate authority to forgive sins on earth. Only Jesus Christ. But when you have ultimate authority, you have the power to delegate it. Jesus had the ultimate authority to forgive sins. He had the ultimate authority to delegate that power to forgive sins. And this <clears throat> is what is so powerful. Because we know this when Christ instituted the sacrament. How, where's this in the Bible, Father? On Divine Mercy Sunday, the eighth day, Jesus came to the apostles in the upper room. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Listen to these words. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. John 20, 23. Basically, Jesus is saying, whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. Heaven has to follow the priest. If the priest tells you you are forgiven, you are guaranteed forgiveness. This is in Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23. These are all there. If the priest says you are forgiven, you are guaranteed forgiveness. Or Jesus is a liar, and as I've said, nobody is going to claim that. This, no, Father, this was only for the apostles. No, Jesus gave the authority. When you have ultimate authority and you give that authority, they also have ultimate authority. So they had the authority to give that authority. And to the priests they ordained, they were given the authority to forgive sins. So if they have the authority, they have the power to delegate that authority. And that's the power of the bishops. And so this passing on of authority is called apostolic succession. We priests in the Catholic Church have an unbroken line. Hands were laid on us, given us the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive sins. Now, ultimately, yes, the power comes from God. The power does not come from the priest. The power comes from God through the priest. The exercise, their power, the priest exercises their power of forgiving sins. Let's look at our next slide. This is a beautiful picture of it. You see what's going on there? All right, you got the penitent, and what's happening? Who's in front of him? The priest. And the priest is raising his right hand, but who's behind him? Christ. The grace comes from Jesus, but it's through the priest. It's the priest's words. Now, when the priest says, I absolve you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This has everything to do with the power God gave him, not from the priest, the power given by Christ to the priest. And so the priest has the power to say, you're forgiven and heaven has to follow him. That was the duplicate to last eight months ago's talk, but I think it was worth re-mentioning. Now let's go to something new. Let's talk about this. How does everything start in the process of forgiveness? It starts with penance or contrition. It's the movement of your heart to have contrition by the grace that God gives that you respond to. That's the key to this whole thing. All right, what does it entail? To be the process to be effective of forgiveness of sins, you must have sorrow I'm sorry, and detest your sins. I don't want to hurt you anymore, Lord. And a firm purpose not to sin again. So you hate the sin, and you don't want to do it again in the future. Now, this is nourished by God's divine mercy, because you trust him that he will help you, give you the grace to keep getting back on your feet. Now, 
What forms does this penance take? What's the penance again? My contrition. Now that contrition, I just said, shows up in the form of sorrow and hatred for sin. Now, what do you do when you hurt somebody? You make it up to them. So when you hurt your wife, you buy flowers. You make it up to her. It's called satisfaction. We do the same thing to God. And there are many forms of contrition or penance that we can do. And most of the time we do these are on Fridays and during Lent. Those are what we call penitential time. This is important. Let's look at our next slide. Because penance can be expressed in many ways, but the Bible tells us prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. The Bible tells us these are the powerful ways that we can be forgiven by God. And I think that thing is powerful. You know what? Let me have Brother Mark put it back up for a minute. Put up that, that slide back up. Prayer, what is that? That's a love for God. So that's one way to show our sorrow. I love you, God, and I'm sorry I hurt you. Fasting, what does fasting do? It is love for yourself. So prayer is a love for God. Fasting is a love for yourself. Well, Father, gee, I'm hungry, I hurt. That's not love. Yes, you're helping your spirit overcome your body. And then giving, almsgiving is love of your neighbor. So prayer, fasting, and almsgiving is a love of God, love of yourself, and love of your neighbor. This is powerful. All right, so when we do this, if we have perfect love, that too wipes away all sin and punishment that we may have in a form of venial sins. And so what we can do is be forgiven of the sin in the confessional, <clears throat> and then the remaining punishment, which remains after the confession, is wiped out when we do prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. It's kind of like the grace of divine mercy Sunday or a plenary indulgence. They too wipe away not just the sin, but the punishment we are owed after the sin is confessed in the confessional. All right, this is powerful. So when we do those things with perfect love, we're forgiven of the punishment due to sin. That's the satisfaction. So you're forgiven in the confessional of the sin, and then when you do satisfaction, you're forgiven of the punishment that you're still owed. And if you heard my other talks, you'll know that when we sin, sin has consequences. Sin scars the body of Christ, creates a wound. When you go to confession, the wound is healed. But the scar on the body of Christ remains. We have to do satisfaction. The sin was forgiven in the confessional. The wound was healed. But after the confessional, punishment still remains. That's purgatory if we don't do something on earth to fix it. But there is ways. There's plenary indulgences. There's prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. But you've got to have perfect love. That's not easy. Or Divine Mercy Sunday, which we can be given complete forgiveness of sin and punishment by going to confession and communion on that day. And we'll talk about that at another time. And I've already done it on one of my talks in the past. All right. What are the elements of confession? All right. Here's where we're getting into the goody, nitty gritty. You have what the penitent does and what the priest does. So what the penitent does, you, is come to repentance through grace. The very fact that you entered into the confessional is a sign God's grace is working in you. It shows the Holy Spirit is alive in you. If you're watching this right now and you haven't been to confession in 50 years, but you're thinking about it now, you're even contemplating it now, the Holy Spirit is working in you. Guaranteed, God's grace is alive in you. The only time God's grace is dead in you is if you turn this off already and could care less. If you are still watching, that means God's grace is in you working, even if he still has to convince you a little bit more. All right, so the elements are what the, the, the sinner does and what the priest does. So the sinner comes in the door. The priest, what does he do? He gives absolution in the name of Christ. 
in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he grants forgiveness and determines the ways for you to make satisfaction. Father, how do I know what satisfaction to make? The penance. That's why when the priest says, I forgive you, but he also gives you a penance, the forgiveness is to wipe away the sin. The penance is to wipe away the punishment. But many times our punishment is greater than what they give us for penance. If I go into the confessional and say, I murdered three people and I get a Hail Mary, I probably got to do some serious more satisfaction. A lot heavier prayer, a lot more fasting, a lot more almsgiving to make up for that. Now, let's go to the next slide. What are those acts that the penitent must do to have a valid confession? All right. For a confession to be valid, here are the acts you must do once you walk in the door. The first thing is to walk in the door, then you need three things. One, we talked about, you have to have a contrition. You have to have a contrite heart. All right, or actually, I'm sorry, the order is reversed here. One, you have to confess all grave sins you can remember. That is important. Number one, confess all grave sins you can remember. Do you have to confess all venial sins? No, we'll get to that in a moment. But all serious sins, and boy, there's a lot of sins that are grave and people don't even realize it. I said this in the other talk, missing mass on Sunday without a reason. Now, quarantine is a reason, a valid reason. Being sick is a valid reason. Having corona is a valid reason. The church being closed is a valid reason. If you miss mass for those reasons, it's not the sin. It's not a sin. But if churches are open, you're not at risk, you're healthy, and you just don't want to go, that can be sinful, okay? Other sins, gossip, masturbation, things that we don't think about can be deadly, all right? So one, we must confess all grave sins we can remember. Two, have some form of contrition. This is what we just talked about which is, can be perfect if it's motivated by love of God or imperfect if it's just based on fear of hell, that's still enough to save you. You can still be saved even if it's only the imperfect contrition of being afraid. I don't want to go to hell. It's still enough to save you. Perfect contrition is I want to serve God. All right, now, remember, the first one, confess all your grave sins, is, is telling all those ones, you could use the Ten Commandments, you can use the seven deadly sins. If you saw my talk a few weeks ago, I walked you through an examination of conscience before a confession on how to confess your sins and how to think of what sins you've committed. Go back if you wish, you can see that video, uh, confessing the sins on uh, using Ten Commandments or seven deadly sins as a basis to do a good confession. So remember, one, confess all grave sins you can remember. Two, have some form of contrition, even if it's just this much. Usually the very fact that you walked in the door of the confessional is enough contrition to save you. Even as I said, if it's only out of selfish love of fear of hell. Now that's not where you want to stay. You want to work your way higher up to love of God, but it's a start. And then finally, number three, do satisfaction, as we just said, start with your penance. Satisfaction or the carrying out of certain acts of penance, like I said, fasting, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. The confessor can help you here. He can give you ideas for penance, and this repairs the damage your sin and my sin caused to the body of Christ. Isn't this amazing? All right. Let's explore this a little more about which sins can be confessed. This mortal versus venial, or I should say, which should be confessed. All right. All grave sins not yet confessed need to be confessed. And how do we know that? I mentioned it to a good examination of conscience. Let's look at our next slide. Before you go into the confessional, you need to experience the power of confession to its fullest. Let's look at these. The first thing you do before a confession in an examination of conscience is pray. Ask for God's help. Let me see my sins. <clears throat> Let me see them in the way that you see them, Lord. How I've hurt you. And then you reflect. 
using questions based on the Ten Commandments, and I add the seven deadly sins, review since your last confession. This is why going to regular confession is helpful because then you don't have as much time to remember, only a week or two weeks or a month. You wait every 10 years. First of all, the church says you shouldn't, but now it's a lot harder to remember everything. All right, next, you ask for forgiveness. You tell God how sorry you are for these sins that, are going to be com- that have, you've committed, and God will then forgive you officially in the confessional. And then finally, you resolve, you make a firm resolution not to do it again. So the confession of serious sins is the only guaranteed way, the only ordinary way to get forgiveness, where forgiveness is guaranteed. Father, how do you know that? Well, it's in the Bible. Really? Where is that in the Bible, Father? Well, I said it. Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23. He told the clergy that they were to forgive the sins, and if they did, heaven would follow. Whose sins you are, who you forgive, are forgiven in heaven. Whose sins you retain are retained in heaven, means you're not forgiven. So when that priest raises his right hand and says, I absolve you, you are guaranteed forgiveness. There's no hoping, am I forgiven? Maybe I'm forgiven. I hope I'm, I wish I'm forgiven. No, you're guaranteed. Well, Father, I just go to my room or I just go outside and gaze up into the sky and ask for forgiveness. Well, here's the problem. Jesus never said your room has the power to forgive sins. Jesus never said the sky has the power to forgive sins. Jesus has the power to forgive sins. And he said he does it not through your room. He doesn't do it through the sky. He does it through his priests. That's how he set it up. We shouldn't tell him he's wrong. Very important. All right. Christ didn't give the authority to the room or the sky. He gave it to the priests. He forgives the sin, but he gave it the authority to the priest. All right, so if you forget a serious sin, you went to confession. I bet this has happened to you before. You've gone to confession, you forget a sin, and you're driving home. You're like, oh, no. You are forgiven. If you honestly forgot that sin in the confession, I don't have selective memory here. God knows if you've really forgotten If you truly forgot, it's forgiven. But if you remember it and it's serious sin, you should, it's a good habit to confess it on your way to the next confession or when you're in your next confession. Go back when you can and confess it. Now, if you are purposely withholding a serious grave sin, your confession is invalid. You don't want to do that. Please don't do that. It's a lot better to be humbled a little bit and not have to worry about being a little bit embarrassed than to lose your soul. We don't want to do that. Now, I'll talk about at the end here, if churches are closed, what do you do? I know you're thinking that. All right. Is or when is a person obliged to confess these mortal sins? At least once a year or every single time before you want to receive Holy Communion. We should never receive Holy Communion in the state of grave sin. So as soon as you become aware of it, you should go. John Paul too, I think, went every week or two. I think he went every two weeks. That's what we do. Our constitutions try to say that. I do it every two weeks because even if you did it every month, you would capture the plenary indulgence of 20 days before or after. That means you have 40 days to get your plenary indulgence. If you go to confession every month, you're covered. It's beautiful. All right, what about venial sins? Venial sins, can they be confessed? Yes, they can. Do they have to? No, they don't. But it's a good idea. Let's look at our next slide. Why confess venial sins? They can be an absolute powerful grace if we confess it. The church recommends it, even if we don't have to. Let's look at this. How? One, it helps us to form a correct conscience. It shows us where we've gone wrong and we recognize it. To fight against evil tendencies because grace is given. I know a lot of brothers who confess venial sins because they want the grace to help against those venial sin temptations in the future. 
Number three, it allows us to be healed by Christ. Christ's actual healing hand is through the sacrament of confession for the soul. Why turn that down? And last, to progress in the life of the spirit through humility of seeing our sheer amount of sin. <laughs> Basically, that says, man, I didn't realize how many sins until I started really wanting to confess all of them, doing a good examination of conscience. Really powerful. Now, why do you not have to forgive or confess every venial sin? Because they're forgiven in the mass. In the penitential rite, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done, commission, and what I have failed to do, sins of omission. So we should confess both. Confess what we did that was bad and what we didn't do that we should have done. And so this is powerful. But those venial sins are forgiven in the Mass. So if you forget all of them in the confessional, fear not. They're forgiven. Now, we receive... Here's the incredible thing. If you have been to confession before Mass for your mortal sins... Even if you sinned in the parking lot of the church coming into confession by yelling at the driver next to you, you are forgiven of those venial sins in the penitential rite. So guess what, everybody? Every one of your receiving of communion, if you've done what the church says, your soul is completely spotless. Because you've confessed your mortal sins and every time you go to mass in the penitential rite, your venial sins are forgiven. So unless you sin in the pew between the penitential rite and receiving of Holy Communion, unless you've done that, you are completely spotless. And if you stay focused on the mass, you will not have fallen even into sins of thought. Stay focused on the Mass from the penitential rite to receiving Holy Communion. You are spotless. Incredible stuff. All right. Let's walk you through now a confession. This is good stuff here. What do you, how do you want to do a confession? All right. For those of you who, who do it regularly, you might learn something. That, oh, I wasn't doing it that way, Father. If uh, some of you have not been to confession in a while, I think this will help. All right. The first thing we said was to do an act of contrition, maybe at home or while you're waiting to go into the confessional when you're in line. We talked about the um, examination of conscience. I'm sorry, did I say act of contrition? I meant examination of conscience. You're walking through your sins, having them in your mind or writing them down and then delete them later. But you're doing that in preparation of going into the confessional. Now, once you walk into the confessional, you kneel down and you say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the priest will say something like, may the Lord be on your heart and on your lips that you may confess your sins and know of God's mercy. That's how I start every confession. May the Lord be in your heart and on your lips that you may confess your sins and know of God's mercy. Then you say, bless me, Father, or you could say, forgive me, Father. That's what many people say because the priest does give forgiveness through Jesus. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been your best guess at how long since your last confession. So bless me, Father. It has been six months since your, my last confession. Welcome back. God bless you. If they tell me it's been five years, I say, praise be to God you're here. Heaven is rejoicing. But do you realize that the church does want you to come at least once a year. So a priest can lovingly correct you there, okay? And never mad, I'm so glad that the people are there. I never harp on them. I'm so grateful that they are in that confessional. Praise be to God. I don't care if it's been 60 years, that's even more praise to God. We are so happy you are here. Heaven is rejoicing you are here. All right, then you walk through your sins, confessing them as best you can, using the Ten Commandments or the Seven Deadly Sins as your guide. 
Don't forget to really analyze them like the first commandment. Nobody confesses to me that they broke the first commandment, but we all do all the time probably in some form because the first commandment is putting anything else on the throne as your God instead of God. Yourself, sports, money, sex, power, career, education. If any of those things become more important to you than God, we've broken the first commandment. So we just walk through them. And if people come to me and they say, Father, it's been, you know, eight months since the last confession, but I really can't think of anything. I walk them through the Ten Commandments and the seven deadly sins. I guarantee you I can uncover a ton of stuff. I kind of smile and, and give the people a big, joyful grin. Say, do you want me to walk you through the Ten Commandments? I don't mean to offend you. But would you wish me to walk you through the Ten Commandments and the seven deadly sins? I bet you we can find something. And I've never heard anybody tell me no. We start unpacking, we start undigging, and they're like, holy cow, yes, Father, I did that. I go on to the next one. Oh, yeah, Father, I guess I did that. Go on to the next one. So a lot of times these people come out with more humility because they realize, oh, wow, I should have been confessing these things. And so you walk through it. Now, at the end of those sins, I asked, now, can you think of anything else? No, Father, that's all I can remember. Okay, God bless you. It was a beautiful confession. Heaven is so happy you are here. God bless you. And so we then take the opportunity to assign a penance. Now, again, Father Seraphim always assigned praying for the conversion of sinners because that's what St. Faustina told us to do at the three o'clock hour. So I will assign that sometimes, praying the chaplet sometimes for life or whatever it might be. <clears throat> but if you want, go beyond your penance and do more satisfaction, more prayer, more fasting, more almsgiving, if you feel your sins are more serious than a Hail Mary. Don't skip out because why the sin is forgiven, even if it's only Hail Mary for killing somebody, your sin is forgiven, but we need to do probably more satisfaction. And so keep that in mind. All right, then at the end of the penance, I say the absolution or I sign the penance. And I sign the penance and the penance is going to be something like if you're struggling forgiving your aunt, I may sign the penance to pray for your aunt. Okay, and then you have to agree to it. You, you have the right to say, Father, can you please give me another penance? Never let a priest give you a penance that has no end. If a priest says your penance is to <clears throat> go to adoration every single day, you, you have to say, Father, I, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can do that. I, there's going to be things that happen. I'm traveling. I might not be able to do that every day. A priest should always give you a penance that has an ending. And so you have the right to ask for a different penance, not because you want to get out of something, but because you may not be able to fulfill it. And so after that, <clears throat> the priest says, okay, this is your penance. Now make your act of contrition. Let's have Brother Mark show a classic example. There are different types of acts of contrition. And, and um, I'm sorry, we skipped a slide, which was the steps of confession. But let's go into the act of contrition. This is what some people come right into the confessional and start praying. But this is what you end with. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins, because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all because they offend thee, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve, with the help of thy grace, to confess my sins, do my penance, and to amend my life, I say, or to avoid the near occasion of sin. This is sometimes said, I detest all my sins because of, you know, because of my love for you, or there's different versions of this. Okay, so don't worry about having it perfect. There's different ways you can say that. All right, so very, very, very powerful. All right, now let's look at this. Now, Confession of sins does not need to be repeated unless you commit it again. I've had people come into the confessional to me and they repeat, they confess something and they say it's only been, you know, two months since their last confession, but they confess something that's happened 20 years ago. 
So somebody says it's only been two months since their last confession, but they committed it 20 years ago. I always ask, well, did you just remember it? Because if you just remembered, it's good to confess it. But no, I, I, I knew I had it, Father. You don't repeat. You don't have to repeat. If you've already been forgiven, that sin is gone. Don't say, well, I want to make sure God heard me. That means you're not trusting. Trust. God has heard you if you've confessed it with contrition. That is what you want. Now, you have a right to go behind the screen. I had one priest one time in my life that really forced me to go to him face to face. I said, Father, I'm sorry. I want to remain behind the screen. He got very mad. And I heard later that priest was disciplined because somebody complained that he said he wasn't going to give them absolution if they stayed behind the screen, that they had to come around to see him. You do not have to. That, that priest is wrong. And so do you know that actually behind the screen is actually more traditional? That's actually more traditional. The priest has heard it all and forgets what you confess. So don't worry. Don't drive around the entire state <laughs> trying, to, trying to find a new priest so that he doesn't think worse of you than the other priest you just went to last week. No, 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 no. All right. As I said, if you forget, go back the next time, confess it. Um, this, is, this is important stuff. All right. Now, what are the effects of confession? Let's look at our next two slides. The effects of the sacrament of confession are powerful. What do you get out of it? You get the forgiveness of sins and therefore reconciliation with God. That's why they call it the sacrament of reconciliation. You also get reconciliation with the church, with each other. The recovery, if you've lost it, of the state of grace. You get the state of grace back. That means heaven versus hell. That's incredible. So the eternal punishment, there's remission of the eternal punishment. That means hell. The eternal punishment is gone. Even if your contrition is imperfect, the eternal punishment is gone. Then next slide, the remission of the temporal punishment, which is a consequence of sin, may be gone if your contrition is very good. Next, peace, the serenity of conscience and spiritual consolation. All right. What about an increase? This is important of spiritual strength as living as a Christian. This is more grace. God gives you more grace. Now, I found a really good video. It's just a couple minutes long. But let me show you this quick video that really summarizes all of what I just told you. And I really, this priest, I'm not familiar who he is. I apologize if you say, well, Father, that priest is liberal or that priest is uh, ultra traditional, whatever it is, I'm sorry, I don't know him. But what he says here is, is right on the money. So let us play this video clip. Probably the least popular sacrament is the sacrament of reconciliation. People are embarrassed to admit their sins. People are afraid the priest might yell at them, but it is a beautiful experience of God's mercy. Some people say, well, why do I need to go to a priest for confession? Can't I just go to my room or go outside and look up at the sky and say I'm sorry to God? Well, you can do that, but you might not know if you've actually been forgiven. God didn't give the authority to forgive sins to your room or to the sky. He gave it to the church. Jesus says to St. Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom. The sins you forgive are forgiven. The sins you hold bound are held bound. Jesus extends that grace to the rest of the apostles after his resurrection when he says the same thing, the sins you forgive are forgiven. So we go to the church to receive this treasury of God's mercy. And when the priest says, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are absolutely automatically absolved of your sins. So you know you have been forgiven. Your room and the sky can't do that. But also, not only in this sacrament are our sins forgiven, we're given special grace and strength from Almighty God to avoid those sins going forward. Yet another great grace of that sacrament is that when we see how freely God forgives us, it gives us the experience of God's mercy to share that mercy and be more forgiving of others. This sacrament is a beautiful way of cleansing our hearts from sin and growing closer to Jesus Christ in his love and mercy. To be forgiven, we only need to be sorry for our sins and we have to have a purpose of amendment. There's no point in going to confession if you're not sorry, and there's no point in going to confession if you're just going to go back and deliberately do the sin over and over again. 
But if we have sorrow for our sins and a purpose of amendment, the grace of the sacrament can cleanse us of our sins, help us to avoid those sins, and help us experience God's mercy and share that mercy with others. Okay, so I think that was a helpful little video to show us about the power of confession. But, you know, I want to go back because I want to mention one last thing about going back into the confessional that I, I forgot. And that is one of the things that people have a tendency to do is to be overly vague or too descriptive. You don't want to really try to be either. You want to just be able to confess those sins. You do not have to go into great detail, but you can't just say, for instance, Father, I was impure. I get this a lot. Now, I'm not trying to probe, I promise you. I don't need details. But if somebody says I'm impure, we are by canon law now. This is not my, my rule. This is the church rule. We confess number and kind. What does that mean to confess number and kind? Well, your best guess at how many times you committed a sin and then what kind of sin it was. Now, if you say you were impure, that could mean either in your thoughts or your actions. So my say, I don't need detail, but are you talking about in your thoughts or in your actions? And they say, in my actions, Father. Okay. Now, the next thing you have to do, for instance, is you do have to say with yourself or with another, because there's a different level when it's with another person. Now you've brought the sin on their soul, too. So that's the problem, for instance, with fornication. Um, fornication, so if somebody's guilty of impurity with masturbation, yes, that's a sin, but there's no other person involved unless you're looking at pornography. Now, that does bring other people into it. But with yourself or with another is important because the confession doesn't need details. You do not do that. But you say, with myself, that's fine or with another. Okay, so you're not married. Correct, Father. Okay, that's all we need to know. Don't need any details. Don't need to know what kind of activity it was. Don't need to know when it was, where it was, or how it was. Just that it was number and kind. Now, some priests, I personally don't ask this, but some priests, and they are able to do this. This is within their right will say, was that experience with another person heterosexual or, or homosexual? And the reason they're asking that is because it is now a different also kind of sin because the heterosexual is still a sin outside of marriage, but it's not against the natural law. It's a sin against the vow, the virtue of chastity. But disordered, as the catechism states, with the homosexual relationship would be considered a different one. So that many priests will ask that. Um, just preparing you in case you're asked not to, to get too upset because the priest is within his jurisdiction to ask that. So the confession goes, okay. Now let's move on. Okay. So the important thing here to remember is that you get to confession. Now, when you go to confession, where do you have to go? <laughs> All right. In times of emergency or real need, you can confess with a priest anywhere. But do you know, technically, canon law 964 says the proper place to hear sacramental confession is a church or oratory. Now, I think we've all violated this. I've had confessions and I've given confessions and gone to confession outside at airports because I wanted to get into a state of grace when I was in my 20s and I was running down to catch an airplane and I see a priest. Yeah, that's okay, I think. Although canon law says if you can, it should be in a church. So don't just say, well, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to go to the playground and catch that priest while he's exercising on the monkey bars and doing pull ups because I'm just too lazy to go on Saturday. No, that's not what we should do. And so the church says it should be in a church if possible. And that's why when confessionals are built, they should also have a gate. When you hear confessions as a priest, there should be a screen available to the, to the penitent. All right. What about this question we get all the time, Father, what about general absolution? My mom used to take me when I was in a kid, to, we would go to Toledo and 
We'd all go into this church and we would stand there and the priest would say, okay, now think of your sins and I'm going to give you general absolution. No, that is not allowed by the church. If you are going and there are some, I still can't believe it, places that are giving general absolution, that's not allowed by the church. The only time general absolution, which means the priest can forgive uh, many, many people at one time without hearing their individual confession is in the time of emergency, like a plane going down. Actually, there was one time in my life that I thought I was going to give general absolution to the whole plane. We were in a storm like I've never seen, and I was watching the, the, the wings bounce up and down, and I thought the wings were going to rip off that plane. The plane was dropping a thousand feet at a time and slamming and it turned on its side. I was convinced we were, we were going to crash. And I was watching those wings and I said, there's no way those wings are going to stay on this plane. They're going to tear off. Later, Brother Mark showed me a video <laughs> of how they test airplanes and they're built to do that. The wings, the wings go up and down. They have this real flexibility. I didn't know that. And I thought I was going to have to give absolution. That would have been acceptable. Now, guess what? If that plane, if I would have done that and that plane would have landed, are you forgiven of all your sins? Yes. With the obligation to go back to the confessional as soon as possible. That is important. You have to go back as soon as possible possible. All right. Now, a general confession, different from general absolution, is acceptable, and that term is kind of misused in the church. It's not technically a general confession, but we call it that. That is just walking through all the sins of your life from start to finish. If you're totally aware that you've confessed sins in the past, you don't need to confess them again, as I said. But if you're doing a general confession and you would like to confess them all over again, yes, that can be allowed. General confessions can be very po powerful. All right, so here's what God is telling us now. All right, this power that he gave to the apostles and the successors in the upper room are linking everything for all time. Jesus is linking peace to the forgiveness of sins. Remember Jesus told St. Faustina, mankind will not have peace until it turns with trust to my mercy. How is turning, how do you do that? How do you turn to trust or turn to his mercy with trust? Confession. You want to know how to bring peace in the world? Go to confession. The first Fridays, the first Saturdays are based on confession and communion. This is powerful stuff. But do you know 75% of Catholics said that they either go less than once a year or not at all? 75% of Catholics less than once a year or not at all. I think this explains the mess that we are in in our world today. So we priests must remind the world that sin exists. Please don't get angry at your pastor when he simply tries to explain that sin is real and we're not to do it. Father, don't dare tell me how to live my life. That's exactly what the priest is supposed to do. Father, don't dare tell me what I use to take my judgment for voting. That's exactly what the priest is supposed to tell you to do. That is canon law. That is in the catechism. He is to help inform your conscience so you know right from wrong so that you can make the right choices. This is important, but he's supposed to do it, you know, in a loving way. And sometimes I've seen priests, myself included, we get so passionate, we seem to forget sometimes portraying that it's all about love. And, and we're so worried about your soul that we come across too passionate. And we don't mean to scare you away, but it, the truth has to be followed. All right. So when we get confession, it paves the way for all other sacraments. You know, baptism is the first, but confession is the next. And this is powerful. So when we remove that roadblock to sin, we can then become shearers in the divine nature of God. That's the purpose of a sacrament, to get the grace to share in the divine life of God. Amazing. All right. So to finish here on this last section, before I finish with Father Seraphim, the form of the sacrament is a grace given by God. The matter is your sins, the form and matter. 
You confess your sins. The priest's words of absolution are the form. Your confessing of your sins is the matter, and it is done. Remember, though, confession is not supposed to be spiritual direction. All right? It is supposed to be the forgiveness of sins. When you got 20 people behind you in line, I remember I was racing to an airline flight, and I was the third person in line at a church, and I got there 45 minutes before confession ended. And there was one person in the confessional. There was like four of us in line when I got there, or three, no, I'm sorry, two people in line when I got there. So I was number three. And by the time the end of that 45 minutes, there was like 20 people in line. It was the same person in the confessional. Now, when that person came out, I was thinking to myself, gee, I hope they confessed lack of charity because now none of us, the priest then came out and said, sorry, I don't have time for your confessions. I look at both the priest and the penitent there. The penitent should be cognizant of the other people behind them and try to wrap it up, say, Father, that's it, I'm all set. And the priest should move things along. Please don't be offended because he doesn't want to walk through your life story. That's spiritual direction, different from confession. Confession can help you, but that's a difference, a slight difference. All right, finally, if the church is not open, Father, what do I do? I have corona, I am quarantined, our church is closed. Yes, remember Catechism 1452. 1452 basically says that if you do an act of contrition from your heart, even though the sacrament of confession is not available, you are forgiven of all mortal, all sins, even mortal, as long as you have the intent to go back to confession when next possible. That's the key. So Father, I can't get to confession. That's okay. You're forgiven. The Catechism 1452 says even of mortal sins, as long as you have the intent to go back when it's next available. And yes, any grave sins during those acts of contrition, you should still confess when you go back to the actual sacrament. Thank you, and God bless you. And let us now finish with just a few words of Father Seraphim and how we're going to wrap up this talk today. God bless him. Let's look at our next slide. Our next slide is Father Seraphim. I picked this picture even though it was his ordination, ordination um, anniversary. We just love that picture. One of our employees, Melissa, is like, that's my favorite picture of Father Seraphim. And so you can see his joy there. All right. Father Seraphim, why do I bring him up now? Because he used to say this all the time. You want to know how to obtain God's mercy? You're looking for God's mercy? You want to get to heaven? Yeah, Father. Well, you need God's mercy. Well, how do I get God's mercy? Confession and communion. And I'm going to be doing communion next week. And so we have to talk to God on a regular basis. Yes, pray, but also receive the sacraments. Make a good confession and receive Holy Communion. You know, before our beloved Father Seraphim passed away, he received the sacraments of confession, communion, and anointing of the sick. Remember the first Fridays? You know, this is all tying together. The reason I'm talking about Father Seraphim today, of course, is because he passed away, but also because this is all making sense to me now. Everything is tying together, and you're part of this. All of this, Jesus promised on the first Friday's devotion, which you have joined us on, on January, first Friday in January, the first Friday in February. If not, start with us on the first Friday in January, February, March. <laughs> and Jesus makes a promise that if you join me for the first Fridays receiving Holy Communion or making a spiritual act of communion, just asking God to come into your heart like you did receive him in Holy Communion, for nine consecutive First Fridays, Jesus promises you will not die without the sacraments. You will die in final perseverance, even if those sacraments have to be given by him spiritually. He promised that. And this is what we saw with Father Seraphim. He did the first Fridays, and he didn't die without the sacraments. He also, now that doesn't mean, well, Father, oh my goodness, my brother-in-law died in, in a car wreck, and he didn't have the sacraments. Yes, God knows, but if he had been practicing the first Fridays, God will make sure he gets the graces of those sacraments. Even if he's not practicing the first Fridays, we pray that he'll still be given the grace. But the first Fridays guarantee it. 
You see what I'm saying? Don't panic because father, my brother-in-law died without the sacraments. Oh my, yes, we should be worried. We should pray. God can still give them the opportunity for that grace. But if he's been doing the first Fridays, it's guaranteed. The other way can still happen. So we pray for it. But the doing the first Fridays, it's a promise from Jesus. So this is powerful stuff. All right. He also, Seraphim, also got the apostolic pardon for the forgiveness of all sin and punishment. And divine mercy, who he was so much a part of, is so important today because the Lord is preparing us for his final coming through divine mercy. And Father Seraphim is the reason that we have the image of divine mercy still today. Now, he didn't paint it, but I'll explain it. The diary, he's one of the reasons we have the diary, not because he wrote it, but I'll explain it. And why we have, our next slide, a canonized St. Faustina. Now, that is because of Father Seraphim. He was the postulator for her cause of canonization. He witnessed her miracles for her beatification and her canonization. Marie Digan and Father Pytel. He was there. He was part of it. So, real quick on Father Seraphim. In the 1940s, he lived just north of here in Adams, Massachusetts. And it was the first church to um, enshrine in the Western Hemisphere, in the Western Hemisphere, to enshrine the image of divine mercy. This is amazing. Now, one of our Marian priests, you've heard me mention, Father Joseph Yarzhambowski, came to this parish, St. Stanislaus in Adams, Massachusetts. They went to close this church a few years ago and the people actually remained in prayer and never left the building. And while there was somebody in the church, they could never close it. So they would do round the clock prayers of people staying in the church and the Holy See actually reversed its decision. That's incredible. You never hardly see that. That's how powerful the prayer is and what these people did peacefully. Now, they weren't rioting and tearing the statues down and burning them. They were praying peacefully. Now, here's what's interesting. Father Joseph Yarzhambowski, the Marian that brought the material of divine mercy to the United States, who personally knew St. Faustina's confessor, Blessed Michael Sapochko, and Blessed Michael Sapochko gave this information to Joseph, Joseph Yarzhambowski. He brought it to the Marian Fathers here in the United States. And this priest, Father Yarzhambowski, went to this little church or big church in Adams, Massachusetts, and spoke about divine mercy. And there was a 14-year-old boy there named Seraphim Mikolenko. And Seraphim Mikolenko heard about this. Now, what's interesting at that same parish was the very first director of the Association of Marian Helpers named Father Walter Pelchinski. Now, he was also a priest, or excuse me, a member of this parish before he became a priest. So you've got Father Joseph Yarzhambowski came there, and you've got Father Pell, who was a parishioner there, and Father Seraphim. Now, here's what's interesting. Father Pelchinski, who was the first director of the um, Association of Marian Helpers, which I now serve as, the director of the association, he did everything to start the Marian Helpers. He's the reason we have the Marian Helpers. And he was devoted to Mary's Immaculate Conception. Guess what day he died? He died on December the 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Now, that's only one of two feasts in the entire year that celebrates Mary's Immaculate Conception. And that's when Father Walter Pelchinski, our Marian priest, died in 2000. Some of you may have known him. Now, the only other feast in the entire church calendar that celebrates the Immaculate Conception of Mary is Our Lady of Lourdes. And guess when Father Seraphim passed? February the 11th of this year, Our Lady of Lourdes. Because at Lord's, Mary said, I am the Immaculate Conception. This is amazing. It gets better. Father Seraphim 
You know, and that back when Mary said in 1858, I am the Immaculate Conception, the Immaculate Conception celebrated on really only those two days fully are the two days Father Pell dies and Father Seraphim dies after dedicating their life to divine mercy and the Immaculate Conception, the two spiritual weapons of our times, Mary and divine mercy. Father, are you Marians or are you divine mercy? We are both because God's greatest act of mercy ever bestowed on a creature is the Immaculate Conception. This is why I'm a Marian and this is why you're a Marian helper. Because these are the only ways out of this mess, Mary and divine mercy. And we Marians are the ones chosen by the God and the church. And he's chosen you to be part of it as our Marian helpers. We are the first community in the world, the first religious community in the world, 350 years ago, to bear the title, the Immaculate Conception. Way before the dogma was declared of the Immaculate Conception. Way, way before. This is amazing. And so this is powerful stuff. The, the dog was declared in 1854. This is powerful. And we're the first men's community back in 1670, almost 200 years earlier, to bear that title. We are also the first men's community founded in Poland. Now take a look at this. Jesus said, a spark will come from Poland to prepare the world for my final coming. Now, we believe that that spark, of course, was St. Faustina, John Paul II, and above all, divine mercy. But we really also believe in a small way, the Marian fathers are part of that spark to come from Poland because of guys like Father Pelczynski, Father Joseph Jarzembowski, and Father Seraphim amazing we bear that title and we came from the location of the spark mary and divine mercy this is why god is using us and you as mary and helpers this is amazing so father sir from real quick what did he do he smuggled he was so humble he didn't even ever talk about it but he smuggled photographic images of the diary out of communist poland on microfilm he had pictures of it and he would always be like, well, I didn't smuggle it. Yes, he did. <laughs> we, have, we have verified that he did. He smuggled it out of communist Poland. Then there was a problem that the, the diary was banned because of a faulty translation into the Italian when the Vatican was reviewing it. It had faulty translations like Sister Faustina saying, I'm divine mercy. Well, you know what? If I'm at the Vatican and I read some nun saying, I am the divine mercy, I'm going to ban it too. The problem was that's not what St. Faustina said. The translation was messed up. And Father Seraphim was integral in getting the corrected translation for the Vatican. Not only did he do that, but he was the reason that the diary was translated into Polish and into English. If you have the English, di English diary of St. Faustina, we owe St. Um, Father Seraphim, <laughs> getting into St. Seraphim, a huge thank you. He stepped in. Not only did he fix the faulty translation, but he stopped the diary from being suppressed forever. Now, he documented both, as I said, Faustina's miracles for her beatification and her canonization. So the fact that she is a saint is directly related to him because he did everything to make it happen. He was the postulator, or excuse me, the vice postulator. But he did it. He did it. He was the vice postulator that basically did all the work. Now, along with Michael Sapochko, St. Faustina's confessor, John Paul II, our beloved Pope, and St. Faustina, who did all this, Seraphim stands, maybe not quite equal to those others like Sapochko and others, but, or John Paul, but he's up there. He is a central figure who made the divine mercy message and devotion the greatest, grassroots, move, the greatest grassroots movement in the history of the church. He was called to this mission, and he knew it at 14 years old, sitting in that parish in Adams, Massachusetts. He was called to this mission. He said, right after Paul VI, 
lifted the ban in 1978. The Marian fathers called Father Seraphim in and said, this is your mission. And he said, then and there I knew I was called by God. He worked a lot with Father George Kosicki, God rest his soul, a Brazilian priest. And he was a rector of our shrine right here where I am standing when it was dedicated at, or when it was made a national shrine the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. This was just a Marian chapel. He was behind all that. And he worked with Mother Angelica to really spread the message around the world through EWTN. And she embraced it. All right, now, I want to finish real quick. Let's look at our next slide. Here's St. Faustina. And this St. Faustina, I think we maybe have already shown it, but I love this picture of St. Faustina. And this is one of Father Seraphim's favorite pictures of St. Faustina. So I think I missed that. But if not, let's go to our next slide. Because Father Seraphim, let's look at our very first thing. This is the old image of divine mercy. Now, this image you may have seen, it looks ghostly, as Father Mike used to say. Father Mike Gately. Where we get this first image that Brother Mark just showed you, if Brother Mark can put it back up on the screen, is actually based on a black and white photograph of the original image. So when you see this image, this is like the weeping Jesus outside my office at the Marian Helper Center, which when we open back up, you're free to come see. This image is the black and white or what was produced from a black and white photograph of the original image. Now, over the years, it got damaged, it got soot, it got dirty, and they painted over it. And when they painted over it, it lost its original significance. Now, about 20 some years ago, Father Seraphim is in Lithuania and him and Father Kaz go to see the, the chapel or the church where Faustina was and they see the image. And Father Seraphim looks, he says, that's not the image of divine mercy. This is not the image, it looks so different. From the first one I just showed you, they had painted over it just a few years earlier, like 10 years earlier. This was 1999 or 2000, and they had painted over it like in 1989. So Father Seraphim saw this and he said, that's it. Bishop, would you give me permission? We Marian fathers and the Marian helpers are going to restore this image. And he said, but it can't be done with just anybody. We got to get the best restorer in the world. Now, Father Seraphim knew that this was going to cost a ton of money. He's not imprudent with the money of the Marian helpers. He knew it was going to be very expensive. But what he said was, we will pay for it. The Marian, Marian helpers will pay for it. You Marian helpers rose up and rose raised so much money that they restored it. They hired one of the best experts in the world. And the next image that we're going to show you is the restored Vilnius image. This is the one that you see here in the shrine. This is the new restored image. This is the vibrance of the original brought back to life. This is the one we Marian fathers promote. We call it the Vilnius image. We wouldn't have this without Father Seraphim. It would have remained covered in a coat of soot and painted over like a coloring book. But Father Seraphim helped do that. And he got you Marian helpers to help that, help with that in that restoration. And that's what Father Mike did. Now, here's where I want to finish. Because I had a long talk with Father Kaz last night. <clears throat> and I want to read you a paragraph from the diary. Now, we're not saying anything definitive here. But we're going to show you something very interesting. The last couple slides, Diary 1689. Today, I saw two enormous pillars implanted in the ground. This is St. Faustina talking. I had, implant, I had implanted one of them, and a certain person with the initials SM, the other. We had done so with unheard of effort. Much fatigue and difficulty. Boy, if that doesn't explain Father Seraphim, I don't know what does. And when I had implanted the pillar, I myself wondered where such extraordinarily, um, my thing broke out there, had come from. 
Now let's look at the next slide. And I recognized that I had not done this by my own strength, but with the power which came from above. These two pillars, hers and this person named SM, were close to, kept close to each other in the area of the image. Now they're talking about the image of divine mercy. And I'm going to tell you what Father Kaz said last night. And I saw the image raised up very high and hanging from these two pillars. Whoa. Now, I asked Father Kaz about this last night. We are not making a statement that that SM is necessarily Seraphim Menkelenko. Then something was sent to me, and I'd like to read this to you. This was a blog that was put by Mark Mallett, a respectable Catholic. They put a very short blog, and I'm going to read it to you online. He said, I had the pleasure of speaking alongside Father Seraphim Menkelenko in California at a few churches some eight years ago. During our time in the car, Father Seraphim confided to me that there was a time when the diary of St. Faustina was in danger of being totally suppressed due to a bad translation. He stepped in, however, and fixed the translation, which paved the way for her writings to be disseminated. He eventually became the vice postulator for her canonization. Now, here's what's interesting. A few years ago, it was declared by an office in the Vatican that a certain passage in St. Faustina's diary referred to her canonization and the initials SM in passage 1689 were Father Seraphim Menkelenko. Wow. Is that not incredible? If St. Faustina was referring to Seraphim Menkelenko with those M SM initials, Father Kaz is not convinced. We are not saying this definitively. This is not church doctrine. We're just saying, wow. Something to think about, to pray about. Now, Father Kaz corrected that he doesn't believe that any office in the Vatican made a specific declaration, but somebody at the, uh, you know, at the office may have had this opinion or felt strongly about it. We don't know. But we do know that the work of Father Kaz and Father Seraphim are unprecedented in the work of this divine mercy. God bless them. And as I finish with my last slide... God bless you, Father Seraphim. May you rest in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless all of you for joining us. I want to stop now before I start crying over Father Seraphim, because he was that instrumental and so if you want to join us in our mission, if you want to be a Marian helper, which Father Pell and Father Seraphim worked so hard, both as Father Joseph, which I am now the Father Joseph, and it's an honor to walk in their footsteps, join us, micprayers.org. Brother Mark has a slide up there. It takes less than 10 seconds. There's no obligation in, in terms of donations or anything. Just, just pray with us. And finally, the last slide and Mark doesn't need to show another video at the end because I think I can catch it all right here, unless he's got a short one, I guess. But shopmercy.org or 1-800-462-7426 has my new book about divine mercy. Please consider getting it. It lays all of this that I talked about with Father Seraphim in terms of how mercy came about, what is divine mercy, how to receive the graces, to understand the image, the novena, the feast, the chaplet, the hour. It's all there. So God bless you all. Thank you. And most of all, Father Seraphim, may the Lord have mercy on you and may you rest in peace. And may Almighty God bless you and yours, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm Deacon Joe Roche, a con of the Congregation of Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and with me today is Father Seraphim Mihalenko, also a Marian. Welcome, Father Seraphim. Good afternoon. I'm Father Seraphim Michalenko. 
of the Congregation of Marys of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. I was a former rector of the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I was founder and former director of the John Paul II Institute of Divine Mercy. I was a former vice postulator for North America in the canonization process of St. Maria Faustina Kowalska. Jesus, I trust in you. You're going to have to do some trusting. I'm only given 15 minutes according to the schedule, but I've got a, perhaps an hour's worth of stuff here. You never change. Don't you get older? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have it. The Faustina must be taking care of you. We see creation as an image of the Father, and we see the redemption as the image of the Son, but the Holy Spirit has only the church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, as representing Him. Like the wind that you don't see, you only see the effects of it. Mm. Well, in a sense, the very word, when we take it from the Latin, particularly, it is misericordia, showing heart to the miserable. That's mm -hmm. God's Miser meaning miserable and cordia yes. meaning heart. heart. Right. Now, in biblical language, heart is the whole being of a person. Okay. Dear friends, may the blessing of Almighty God and His mercy be upon you through His grace and His love for humankind at all times, now and always, and forever and ever, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.